Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks from the New Art School. Our guest today is Bradford Hansen Smith. Welcome, Bradford. Thank you, Latouras. It's good to uh, see you and talk with you again. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, uh, the last time I couldn't see you, but we talked together. So this time I can see you. So that makes it more personable, more intimate, if you can even call virtual reality intimate. <laughs> but I would like to um, sort of add to what we talked about before in terms of observation and the conceptual aspect of the information that was generated in the one fold of the circle, of which there's far more information than, than we have ever imagined, because we don't fold circles. So why would we imagine anything is in the folding of a circle? So I think we've, we've covered that pretty much in terms of how at least some of that information is there. What I would like to do this time is to show you, you know, taking this, this circle and folding it in half, the reforming of that circle with just one straight line and the circumference. And it doesn't sound like there's much there that we can do with that. And I think primarily, and it took me a lot of years before I understood that the straight line that we consider a straight line is what we draw on a flat plane. And the circle is a curved line that we draw on a flat plane. And they're different on the flat plane. These are not different. There's the circle, there's the straight line, the same thing. It took me a lot of years before I figured out that, oh, I can curve this straight line. You know, I can make it a circle. So now all of a sudden my straight line is a circle. Now what does that mean in terms of pi, of diameter to circumference? When we've taken the diameter and we've made a circumference with it of a different proportion. And do those proportions, those ratios still hold up? Because I could take then this circle, measure the diameter and make a smaller circle. So we've got an infinite progression of diameter to circle. And it's the same ratio of pro pro progression but it's different measurements, different numbers. So that changes the whole ballgame. So this I found interesting, but I didn't take it too much further. I did play with it a little bit, realizing that you can then you know, take this and because you folded it, you can tuck one part into the folded part and now you've got the circle. You've got basically a cylinder. Mm -hmm. The fact that this is not here, your planes are infinite. Yeah. So you've just made a cylinder. Now we also know that you, we can take that and we can, we can pull it in and make, we can make a cone. So from that once, one fold, we can make a cone in the cylinder. All right, well, that's pretty interesting because normally we think of those things as separate from the circle. And the circle is only a part of, a slice through a cone, you know, a top and a bottom of a cylinder. And, and we're very um, pragmatic about how we keep things separate. So here we're finding it all happens in the same place. Now, a couple of things is that when, see here we've got something different happening with that cone. So you can see this, and this is very much what plants do. You know, they have a cylinder, which we call a stalk, and out of the stalk, nestled inside is another layer that itself will then come out. And then, and there's, there's a growth, a mechanical growth process in this first fold in the circle that we can begin to demonstrate in a different way. Now, because we can do this, it was a number of years after that when I realized a Mobius strip. That's really about surface. It's not about the strip. The only thing, the only reason we confine it to a strip of paper is because 
Mobius used a strip of paper and twisted it 180 degrees and found out that it was a continuum. So we call it the Mobius strip. It's about surface. So I thought, if it's about surface, then I should be able to here, take, take this, which is a surface, and twist it 180 degrees and hook it back up to itself. So here you can see where we've got the curved edge to now. If, if I were to then twist this 180 degrees and hook it back up to itself, I then have a Movia surface. And there's one that's already made, so you can see that the surface is a Movia surface. It's not a Movia strip because it wasn't made with a strip. It was made with a, with a circle folded in half. To really understand what that is, I had to do what we all do with Mobius strips. We had to see that this, in fact, does go all the way around. It's one continuous surface. The difference is interesting because now we have one continuous edge, but that edge has a point, a point of where it deflects, takes it angles off. It, it goes around and then it angles under. So that that's, that's one of the differences between the strip where the edge is continuous and here the edge is continuous. There's a, an angle of change, deflection. But the surface is still singular. So I found that interesting. And there again, it's just observation of what I was doing over a period of time before I could get out of my head what a Mobius strip is, what a cylinder is, what a cone is, and see that they were all a folded circle. So then it was like to take this, and when I folded the curve, I folded the curve to the straight edge, which you cannot do in 2D. I thought, well, this is interesting because it basically is a tetrahedron pattern. Now, this is made from that circle and it's a tetrahedron. It doesn't look like it. The properties are not the same, but it does have four points. Mm -hmm. It has curved edge and a straight edge. So we've got a straight edge and a curved edge, two edges, not six. And it's got one continuous surface, not four. There's no four, there's no triangles there. So this is in fact a tetrahedron. And it functions exactly like a tetrahedron would function in terms of making a two frequency and creating octahedron and doing all the stuff we do with tetrahedron can be done with this. So why do we define a tetrahedron as a polyhedron with six edges, four planes, and four points? That ties us into a certain way of thinking that eliminates all other possibilities. And this was just through observation and making connections and folding a circle in half. What can I do with that? So periodically I come back to, um, you know, this the idea of them folding. Here we have a point. We have a circumference or two halves circumferences. And we can put them together. And so we can actually show that I've started from this point and putting the circumference and the diameter together. I'm trying to do this and watch it in reverse. It's kind of...
concerning. But, and then having you see what I'm doing here. But, but you get the idea that mm -hmm. yeah. from that point, we're creating this diameter now becomes two because you've doubled over the circumference. So you've got two plus the difference, which is an exact. If, if you're exact in your, in your bringing those edges together, then the leftover is going to be exactly in proportion to what you brought together, the curved and the straight edge. Now, the number pi is not exact, and we've been arguing about it for centuries, about what, what is that number really, and how precise is it? And the numbers are not precise. There's no precision to a number. It's just a, a language description of measurement, which is what geometry says. Earth measure, things of the earth measure, tells us to measure. This is not about measurement. This is a proportional division. And as it turns out, that two times the diameter measured by you know, the circumference, as it turns out, this is a little bit more than one third. So it gives you three point, whatever that difference is in proportion. Mm -hmm. And if you try and put a number to something that cannot be measured, it's not going to work. So we generalize, we make a compensation and we say, okay, we're just going to call it good. We're going to generalize. We're going to reduce it down to something we can understand rather than get rid of what we've been told to understand and observe what it is we're working with. Now, another aspect of doing that is when you take that point and you put the together, you get to this point, but instead of leaving it open like we just did, I closed it up. All I did was bring this, bring that difference together and get this beautiful shape. Kind of like a tooth, you know, it's, it's, you've got this, this sharp edge. It goes around and then you've got some surface to anchor it into a, a jaw or whatever you wish. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very tooth-like, but it's also very biological in terms of growth. You know, it's, it's that kind of form. So this can also, this, this is where you see it without squeezing these together. And incidentally, that squeezing together, if you understand that the tetrahedron is always a right angle of opposite edges, which is why then this has one straight edge and one curved edge. They're at right angles to each other. So that's understanding that the right angle is not the thing we measure. It is a function of movement. It's a totally different way of trying to understand whenever we see a right angle. What does that really represent? It doesn't represent 90 degrees. It represents a movement that we stopped. And so that's, that's like taking, so taking, our, uh, taking our circle and creasing it. And, you know, it goes from 180 to 180, and we've taken the 90 degrees, stopped it right there. Because numbers work that way. 180 divided by 2 is 90. Divided by 2 is 45. So the 45 and the 90 are the only angles that we've pulled out of 180 degrees. And, and then those, that 90 degree then becomes the, uh, the angle for the Cartesian grid, the angle that we got stuck in, the angle of the boxes we made for ourselves that we can't get out of because we're tied into that 90 degree end when it's actually a movement. Oh. <laughs> This is, movement goes in both directions. So it goes this way and it goes that way. Yeah. That's 360 degrees. 
So if we take this folded circle off of the flat plane and understand we're working in space and moving, then we've moved 360 degrees and we've got a spherical pattern of movement. And the compression of the sphere gives us the circle, so this is showing us origin. Source of the circle is the sphere. I mean, we conceptually acknowledge that. But how many people have actually demonstrated this is why? Takes us back to a spherical envelope. Everything I fold with this circle is in that spherical envelope. Well, the circumference is the limit of the spherical envelope that this circumference can fold. No matter how you fold it, it's always going to be less than that spherical envelope. The circle is concentric, so it goes in as far as it goes out. There is no center to it. So the, the concentric quality of the circle tells us that envelope, that spherical envelope, is as large or as small as our imagination can go with that circle. I mean, th there's a world to play with through observing what you're doing that is just not accessible in any other way. We cannot imagine that you can take this and make a tetrahedron with one fold. And yet there it is. It's just not in the form we acknowledge. So um, here we've got our tooth-like form. Leave it open and now, because we fold it in in half, all of a sudden we've got interior space exposed around that tooth-like shape. So that opens it up for further exploration. Now, these are things that just came up over the years, as I would periodically say, I need to go back and look at that first fold in the circle because there's more there. And I have never been disappointed. I've always found something more there. And I never find it in any math book or geometry book, and I never hear anybody talking about it. Now, when we looked at, when we looked at this, we can also slide slide that point along that circumference. So now you have what appears to be a spiral. Right? So there's another aspect to that fold. Speaking of the spiral, let's go back a little bit further. And we've got we've, we've covered, I think, before taking two points and putting them together. And that gives us our kite shape. But that's also a primal spiral because wherever you put your two points, that's going to change the diameter of that, um, this circle as opposed to this circle, which is going to change the opening of that spiral. And that spiral can continue on as the circle enlarges or expands. So there in that first fold again is another, another forming of a spiral relationship. Um, and it's going to be unique for every person, just like no two people ever put the same points together. So when you think about the very beginning of that little embryo of whatever creature or plant life form it is, it starts with a different proportion spiral. So you can then trace back to origin, proportion of movement that makes the difference of the formation of the patterns that we talk about. That kind of covers the, the forms. There's more variations to those as you explore. So I would encourage anybody who's interested in the, the, um, the forming of that first fold to explore it. Don't think about it. Just because I showed it to you doesn't give you any information. Doesn't give you the experience. The experience is the information. It's the doing. If we don't do something, we have no experience. We have nothing to pass on. So there is no body of knowledge. 
or at best as an individual, if I don't figure out what I need to do to expand and, and develop a collective body of knowledge, then I have not filled my responsibility as a human being. Absolutely. And that comes from knowing, identifying what it is that you can do that's uniquely, visually yours that nobody else can do. Even if you're doing the same thing, we all folded the circle, but we all folded it differently. And that allows us a different perception. Well, I think I talked about it last time, about <clears throat> with, with a group of kids folding the circle in half and asking what they saw. And one girl said, I see shadow. Mm -hmm. I see a shadow. Now, that should that told me that there is no one way to describe what you observe in folding the circle in half. It's just that she didn't buy into folding a circle in half. You get a line down the center and you get two halves. She was going with what she observed. So what happens if you what happens if you don't fold it? What's that? What happens if you don't fold it? If you don't fold it? Yes. And and you try to 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 do the 3D just from the sphere, just from the sphere. That's a good question. You just put that out, for, out there for anybody who wants to pick it up. And of course we we know we take the concept of a circle and we make all kinds of things with it. You know, our lives are filled with circle forms, you know, from steering wheels to car wheels to houses to what we drink out of to, you know, we have endless forms of reforming the concept of circle. And we have as many endless metaphors for using what we think the circle is to explain what we don't know or can't explain. So the circle works probably more efficiently as a metaphor historically than it does anything else. But in fact, the circle is something of itself. So how do you take them? What can you do without folding this in half? All right, I've played with it and, and I think it's worth anybody playing with that idea. What I found was that Whatever you do with it, it's going to happen within that envelope. It's not going to happen outside that envelope. What is that envelope? We're talking about movement. It's a dance. It's not just one 360 degrees. It goes, it goes this way. It goes this way. One can follow the other around or it can change. You know, it's like two partners doing a dance. Now, one partner might lead, so the other follows, and the other might decide to lead, and the other one then follows. So you've got two directions, which is no longer 360 degrees. I'm talking about 740 degrees, or 720 degrees. <clears throat> we have two halves. Before we folded it, we didn't have two halves. We just had a top of you know, three circles, basically, front, back, and the edge. Okay, so here we've got, we've got 1,440 degrees of movement if you're considering the two partners and the possibilities of how they move together. And I, I, I like to think of that in terms of two people dancing. What are the possibilities of movement between those two individual people, between these two individual things that are not separate in a dance. They are connected through the movement. How many different ways are they connected? And we've just looked at a few of them in these forms. Recently, and this is after 45 years of looking at geometry and 35 years of folding circles, that I have finally gotten my head around the fact that the circle has no center. I knew that because when I start with a circle, it doesn't have a center. The center is this is the second fold that occurs 
I think we went through that last time. At that point, I was still stuck on the point and the center. The circle is the point, and the point is the circle because of the concentric nature of what a circle is. Only recently have I realized the circle can have two centers. Well, normally when we think about two centers of a circle, and what we're really describing is an oval. We've taken two circles, two centers, and put them together, and then we can connect those two circles with a larger arc, and we get an egg shape or an oval. Mm -hmm. So every oval has at least two centers, but that's not a circle. That's an oval. I have come to realize the circle has two centers. doesn't fit our concept of circle. The circle with no center, or the circle as center, doesn't fit our concept of circle. It's not what we were taught. It's not what we believe. Because we believe what we were taught rather than to observe. And it's taken me a lot of years before. I'm going to show you this little unit. That's something we draw with a compass. Three arcs. And that gives us a center point. It's a 2D image. Same 2D image. We draw from a circle. Each one of them has a center point. There's two center points. Because we flattened this whole three-dimensional experience that we have into two dimensions, and that's what we see. We don't see the, the compression, the distortion that happens. This is one circle, one circle. Now, you can see the three. You can see the three. You can see how these, these are the inside of the circle. And you see the ridges on the circumference? That's where the circumference is. It goes behind. Well, it goes behind, but we only see on the flat plane. We don't see what's behind. So when you're, you're and you can take this, three diameters, give us this. What's the difference between these? The difference is this gets flattened out. We never take a circle and divide it into, you know, either a hexagon. And then to know that each one of these curves is simply the tracing of that rotational movement of that line. That's where we get the three curves. You don't have to draw it with a compass. Because there's no context. It's just a flat image of an idea. This is real. Taking a circle, folding it, draw the footprint, there it is. Don't need a compass. The circle is the compass. Same thing with when you fold the hexagon. Fold that over. Fold it over. So what happens, these six Petal shapes of the hexagon get folded over each other. Those two that are adjacent get put onto the other because they fit exactly. So you've got actually six petals there and three petals there. So you've got all nine petals. But you're only seeing three here because they've been doubled up. Now, I could not double them up and it does a whole different thing but it doesn't change the fact that it's got two centers. And I don't know. I think this is brand new information because we are so tied into the two-dimensional circle and how we define it as a single center that we don't think about it in any other way. And I'm not even gonna go into the, the reconfiguring of this circle using the curves. That's a whole other landscape. Comes out of the straight lines, but the straight lines are a reduction of the rotation of movement. Holding it in half, that's a rotational movement. There's nothing to draw because everything's in alignment. But here, when you're folding one point to another point, you can see where the circle lines to itself. 
So the circle will give us all the information we get from a compass, except it does it using one diameter and one circumference, which is not really what we're dealing with at all. We're dealing with one circle, two centers. When we take it off that flat plane and look at what's behind, what's underneath that plane that we've never questioned. So when you start, this basically is a dual tetrahedron. You've got one, two, three, four points. One, two, three, four points. So you could classify that as a dual tetrahedron. On the other hand, you've got one, two, three, four. You've got one, two, three more tetrahedrons. Just observing what's there reveals information that is hidden because of our dogmatic view of what things are. You know? Think about what they are. Look and see what they are. Observe. Think about it. It's taken me a lot of years to understand that there are two centers to the circle, but I can show you that. I can give you proof of that because you're still only talking about one circle. What do we do with that kind of information? How do we fit it into what we know? We don't. Good. We don't even try. We use it for what it is and we explore it for what more it is. And so when we set out to design something, we're designing from of what we know, what other people know, and our experience in what a good design is that often we call pattern. And there's a great confusion with the words we use to describe the experience we have that is beyond description. Numbers fall short of describing the proportional relationships that occur in a circle, in a spherical envelope. This, this is, it's a proportional progression of expansion. And we talk about a number progression. And then we base concepts based on those number progressions. What is an exponential progression? Has anybody ever experienced that? No, but it's a concept, and we all think we know what that means. It goes, just goes to infinity. Well, we have a lot of other concepts that describe infinity. The circle is the center is another concept that describes infinity. But we do not use that as an example of infinity. We use numbers and these concepts of exponential, which have no experiential meaning. But they're a wonderful metaphor, and they can hook up ideas. And that's what our minds do. But just thinking about little, little baby creatures that are born the instant they have no concept. All they have is experience and observation and touching and feeling. And what are the relationships of things? And that begins to build connections, neural connections in the brain. And then once, once we experientially have an understanding of, you know, our stomach says, I'm hungry, I'm going to cry because I get fed, We've made some neural connections that are meaningful. They're survival connections. And then when mommy and daddy and the culture says, no, don't do that, you'll get hurt. That's okay, but don't do that. All of a sudden, these extraordinary connections that have been made are being truncated. They're being cut off. They're being downsized. And before long, we are getting these concepts. And again, the, the neurons are still functioning, making connections, but they're making connections between a reality inside our head. They're not making connections to our experiential understanding. 
So that way, it's very easy then to take a child whose neural connections have been rerouted to concepts and ideas. To teach that child is you start with a point, one dimension, and then you have two dimensions, which is a line, as a plane. Then you have three dimensions, which is a cube. Then we'll extrapolate a fourth dimension. Why? Because we're all working off of a 90 degree angle. Granted, that angle is moving in dimensions, but it's still 90 degrees, doesn't change. So all of a sudden, the beauty of this movement got stuck as a concept, 90 degrees. And then our neural connections are conceptual, they're not experiential. And then when we experience something like a circle has two centers, wait a minute, How, what do my neurons do with that one? They're already set up to see it on 2D with one center. Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to change that connection that's already in place that I've used for year after year after year after year? How do I change that neural connection? By doing something and observing. That's how I change it. And now I've got a whole landscape that doesn't look anything Euclidean at all. It's not projective imagination. It's, it's not spherical. It's something of its own nature. This is just one aspect, one, na one aspect of the nature of the circle. Now, I've got another 35 years of exploring these curves and not straight lines because all we did was we took, we took that curve from that rotation and reduced it down to a straight line and then began to connect points by straight lines. And all of a sudden, we've got 2,500 years of Euclidean geometry. Think of how many neural connections those are that are ingrained in every DNA that we got to somehow not get rid of, but expand, open them up. Understanding we're talking about patterns of movement. There are no straight lines in the universe. And yet we, what do we do? Here our telescope showed us this sector of the universe or of the cosmos. And how do we show it? We show it in a cubic form. We show it in a square. It's not in a square out there. It's not in a cube. Those are in our heads. People ask, how do I get out of the box? This is how you get out of the box. You observe first you're in a box, how you got there. And if it's not comfortable, step out of the box. If it's comfortable, so be it. I don't know what more I can say left, Harris. No, this is it's absolutely it's beautiful. I mean, so... Yeah, but just the the idea that the circle has two points is just, just enough for, for just, it's amazing. Mind-blowing. That's why we've got a mind, is to blow it up, to enlarge it, to find out what the mind is. We don't need to know what the brain is. Yeah. All we need to know is the brain is a hammer. It's a tool we use, okay? And you can use a hammer in a lot of different ways, and we use our brains in a lot of different ways. But I'm, I like to think about this, this idea, this metaphor of a hammer. The first guy that saw the advantage of a hammer got excited and told everybody. And you know what everybody did with it? They went around banging on everything they could, destroying whatever they can. Until finally they realized, maybe there's a better way to use a hammer. Maybe there's a better way to use the brain. It's simply a tool that allows the mind to give consciousness to the outside world. And it does that through neural connections. Neural connections of what? Experience, not concepts. The entire 
body of human knowledge means nothing to that baby when they are born. And if they stay with their experiential understanding of their life as they develop, it will be of interest, the body of human knowledge, but it's not going to be important because they're going to understand it's what they have to give to that library of other people's experiences. Absolutely. Well, anyway, here we are. Uh, <laughs> I haven't so had my you, breakfast you have yet. Your new books, your new books coming out as well recently? Um, I get into this in a very obtuse way because I didn't understand this yet, but it's there in the book. If you see this and you go through the book, you'll get it. Wonderful, wonderful. You'll understand that there's a whole lot more than what I knew when I wrote the book. Wow, amazing! Well, thank you so much. It's been it's been amazing again, and uh, we'll keep in touch so that you, if any, there's anything else that we can update as well. I'm sure there'll be some updating. In fact, I'm trying to figure out how to actually present the circle with two centers, because that's really getting at the crux of two dimension and the concept of what that means and putting it into our experiential reality and how to do that in a way that doesn't doesn't foster a counter reaction to no the circle has one center mm. you know how do i do that without <laughs> confronting people annoying their comfort because it's, it is exciting Absolutely. and it opens up a whole new world of not just exploring and observing, but playing mm -hmm. a whole nother country of play. And if we're truly playing, we are observing what we're doing. Play and observation are not separate. We tend to think that we can design a game and then people play it and we've got a product and they've got, you know, um, we haven't contributed anything to, to the concept of the experience of play. I shouldn't say anything. We haven't, we haven't contributed very much. It keeps us in the box. Anyway, I need to go get some breakfast. I haven't Brilliant. had breakfast. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.